Whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. This is a feel good phrase people just love to repeat. The only problem is, it's not quite what Nietzsche said. Actually, there are other problems. It's meaningless, it's empty, it's cliche. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that Nietzsche would be the last guy to build such a meaningless phrase. He was after nuance, subtlety, often using paradox and humor. And these are the tools of a philosopher who, as you may or may not know, said yes to the eternal recurrence of the same. He didn't reject anything in reality, or at least throughout his career, he worked to the point of being able to say yes to reality and build an acceptance of all things just as they are to make himself be something like dynamite, which is the word that he used for himself. And this was a strategy to help keep himself awake to the way that the royal we rigs the game. And this idea of a royal we is part of what he's getting at in this phrase, which has been butchered, cut in half, and it isn't even remotely what Nietzsche really said or what he meant or what he wanted us to possibly think he meant, because there is possibly a little riddle in it. So what makes the misquote so sticky? That's the topic of today's episode of What Makes It Memorable. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier. Hit that thumbs up, get subscribed if you're new here, and join my mission to bringing magnetic memory and mental literacy to people around the world, especially for critical thinking. We clearly need more people rocking the simplicity boat so we can swim together in the great ocean of complexity. Become the ocean, I believe Nietzsche says at one point. And it is really, really important because we often are rejecting the world as it is because what Nietzsche actually wrote in one of his shortest books, Twilight of the Idols, is all about helping us become that ocean of what we really are, but we have to realize how the game is rigged against us and how we sort of participate in it and how we can accept it when we can't change it. And it is quite fascinating. But the quote is really very different than how it gets quoted. Aus der Kriegsschule des Lebens, was mich nicht umbringt, mag mich stärker. Now, I've seen this paragraph translated in several ways, and I call it a paragraph instead of a paragraph. <laughs> That's a fun little phrase my friend Kane X. Fauché often used. But here's my stab at translating it. I, I'm someone who speaks and reads German at a fairly decent level, and I would make it more something like this. Out of the military school of life, what doesn't murder me makes me stronger. Now, Again, I'm not a translator, but that's the way it reads to me. And you could actually say, instead of out of the military school of life, more directly, the war school of life. The point is, is that out of the military school of life or out of the war school of life, what doesn't murder me only makes me stronger. That first clause, it really kind of matters. Don't you think? I hope you'll come to think so if you don't already. And there's a memory science reason that might explain why people drop it and more on that later. But what do you think Nietzsche might mean by having this clause out of the war school of life at the beginning? And you might also think, why doesn't the Joker add it when he changes the quote from Nietzsche in The Dark Knight? You might remember that scene where the Joker says, whatever doesn't kill me only makes me stranger. <laughs> I mean, if you analyze this scene from The Dark Knight, the Joker is delivering it in the context of his own personal school of life. And we have to assume that he's being a untrustworthy narrator there, but he does sort of implicitly have a school of life context to when he uses it. So that's really, really interesting. Trust in the speaker is in fact part of what Nietzsche is getting at here with his Aus der Kriegsschule des Lebens. Because this idea of being out of the military school of life or out of the war school of life, he's pointing to existence as a kind of battle, but also literally a world during his time and our time too, where soldiers go to school to learn the craft of war, but also learn many other topics. These are topics that are taught by institutions that often have propaganda and often they are propagandizing war as a solution. Now, of course, many people will say, isn't Nietzsche that philosopher of strength and survival of the fittest? And I would say, you know, those tendencies are there. 
but also there's a lot of paradoxes, there's a lot of willful contradictions going on, so read them again, read them in full. Not just the cherry-picked quotes that people have screen-grabbed and posted on your favorite social media site. A lot of that is poison. I mean, Nietzsche might not be your bag, but I think we can agree that pulling quotes out of context is risky business at best. Now, of course, Nietzsche also pulls quotes out of context, and in many ways, some of his books are difficult because these little paragraphs, they're like tweets. He sort of anticipated Twitter culture in many, many ways. But he's also the one who goes out of his way to tell you that Nietzsche is human himself. So when he's pointing his finger at, oh, look at Kant, and you know, we'll have this quote from these different philosophers, he, he knows that there's an impulse of humanity that's causing him to do this. There's something that he wants to point to, which is the impulse itself. And he writes about this very eloquently, inhuman, all too human. You know, Nietzsche wrote across a lifetime, and some of his ideas do contradict themselves over time, but he points this out. And one other little nuance here is he points out that you can't really use language without contradicting yourself. It's one of the reasons that he leans into this idea of being trained by society in a military school of life. And he's using language to work out and expose the limits of language as a tool for meaningful expression. This is part of why Nietzsche has stuck around, is because his use of language helps us look at how language operates. So it's reasonable to preserve humans who expose the limits of reason itself while helping you think through its pros and cons, and that's part of what makes Nietzsche memorable overall. But by the same token, it's really, really important that the core ideas that he's pointing to, the nature of truth, and the facts that he has in his philosophy, they don't change necessarily. Or he would say that they may have a certain relativity to your personal perspective, but your personal perspective is not personal. So a lot of people get this really wrong about Nietzsche. They think he's a relativist and so forth. This is, I think, poorly misunderstood. One of the things about facts is that there's nothing fixed right? Everything is a, a property that's coming into being. New evidence changes the status of what a fact is. So even the most factual fact is subject to change. So he is very much a scientist in this regard, a true scientist who doesn't really have a stable, this is the way things are, but rather he's pointing to what is it in humanity that would ever make such a statement? This is the way things are. So, you know, contemporary neuroscience is fairly clear about many of the things that Nietzsche deduced through observation, through logic, and one of those things is the absence of free will. Now, the idea of free will is very, very contentious, but part of the military school of life is the training in thinking that you do have it, and you might want to think about how that does it really make you stronger, or do those beliefs actually wind up killing you? The belief that you have free will, right? Or murder you. I think murder is a very important word here, and it's the translation I would choose given the German word umgebracht. So part of this free will thing is really, really important to the context of this quote. So it's not that we have free will, but rather there's a life force that flows through us. It has laws, like gravity has laws. It causes us to behave in ways that promote survival and thriving, but in a Kriegsschule, it may be that it promotes the survival and thriving of the powers in your society, not necessarily what you feel as your potential power or fullness of being without that repetitive, rote learning guidance to think a particular way. Now, this power within, this energy, this law that follows laws like physics and gravity follow laws, he sometimes called this the will to power. And this will to power is so clever, so to speak, that it makes us also think that we're doing things of our own accord. It also uses the brain to create the illusion of free will because 
if we didn't, you know, we probably would be very different creatures. So in many ways, we're acting out a larger cultural program like ants following a signal from an unseen queen. And there's multiple programs going on at the same time. And this is why this idea of perspectivism that he has is not relativism. It's really just changing like a memory wheel, like we talk about on this channel sometimes rotating a memory wheel to see things from multiple perspectives and to see the multiple signals from multiple unseen queens as we helper ants go around basically playing out the program. Where does the program come from? And does it really make you stronger? One of the strategies people use to survive and thrive is war, literally, but also war by other means, such as the war of misquoting people knowing that certain buzzwords and snippets of phrases are going to catch on. Some of these misquotes and butchered quotes catch on so well that many people never check the actual source. They just follow the invisible queen's signal and spread and spread and spread the idea until it can spread no more. And then it doesn't matter how many fact checkers correct the record because it's already spread throughout the culture because whatever doesn't kill you only makes you stronger, right? <laughs> well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it makes you weaker and weaker and weaker because you're following the program of the military school of life. So let's talk a little bit more about this idea of umbringing or being umgebracht, murdered or killed. I think murder instead of killed, as in was mich nicht umbringt, macht mich stärker, is so important. Whatever doesn't murder me makes me stronger out of the military school of life. Well, Umbrian can mean kill, but it can also mean to murder, it can mean to slay, it can mean to commit suicide, it can mean to knock off, to snuff, and so on. In fact, the majority of possible meanings have to do with topping yourself off, not being killed from an external source. And this is what becoming a soldier might do. You are programmed by society to think that of your own free will, of your own volition, you're signing up to the military or you're signing up to this or that ism. Are you really? Are you really doing it of your own volition? Or are you following an invisible signal from the queen? This is a paradox that is possibly not resolvable, but you have to think and Nietzsche is asking you to think, what are you doing because you want to do versus what you're doing because your culture has programmed you to think that schools are valid institutions in the first place. In other words, there's kind of a Zen slap or a joke designed to wake you up, to elucidate you to a different perspective. You are told by the schools of life that by surrendering yourself to being either literally or symbolically murdered, you will be literally or mythically stronger. Now, if you're dead, your society may be literally stronger because theoretically you went off and sacrificed yourself for the greater cause. But in reality, you will be worse than dead. You will have belonged to the herd that sacrifices itself to fulfill the purposes of a power that is not your own as an individual, insofar as there is even such a thing as an individual. And these are where paradoxes and contradictions come into play in Nietzsche's philosophy. But let's just think about this school that makes you think that your ideas are your own. This is the function of schools as propaganda. And you really don't have to look very far to find all kinds of examples going on in the world these days. Propaganda not only makes you accept a kind of slavery, but you love it so much that you actually apologize for it and you explain it and you justify it and you then go on and find other ways to justify it as a sunk cost fallacy with all your student loans requires you through, you know, taxation that you're also paying to constantly keep fulfilling on those student loans and people justify it again and again and again, even though the grip on their lives is strangling them to death. Now, of course, this is just philosophy at the end of the day. Intellectual noodling, right? Or is it? No, I think Nietzsche is literally criticizing the military and the education system of his time, but projecting it and extending it to how education works as a whole. Later on in Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche writes, what is the cause of the decline of German culture? 
that higher education is no longer a privilege. The democratism of culture made universal and common. Not to overlook the fact that military privileges absolutely compel too great an attendance at higher schools, which means their ruin. Now, at a certain point, I'm not sure I totally agree with Nietzsche on this, but he's partly not even making a point. He's pointing out a paradox. More access to education is not leading to more peace. It's leading to more conflict. This is something you might connect to Freud in Civilization and its disconnect. Freud basically is saying peace is not peace. When there is peace or the illusion of peace, it means that the aggression has been turned inward. And we might be seeing a little bit of that now and probably in the future too. You know, the, the real important point here is that things are rarely what they seem. They're part of training. And when we are being caused and called to quote unquote symbolically murder ourselves, then some kind of energy builds up and it's either going to be outward directed or inward directed. Now, when it comes to the pros of education, I think that we can't go full hook, line, and sinker here that it's all just propaganda and training. I mean, I'm a critical thinker and I'm very grateful for the education that I had because it could have been something else. It could have been somewhere else in the world. And so it kind of doesn't really add up that not just myself, but a whole generation of people like me wound up doing okay and being critical of the system that we're from, but also capable of being grateful for its many, many pros. And you know, part of the question always is, is what are people doing to get involved in any kind of educational reform or taking personal initiatives to be educators unto themselves. So I think that this is something that I'm very grateful to do. So thanks for being part of it. But uh, let's carry on with Nietzsche himself, because a page later in Twilight of the Idols from this quote where he's questioning the role of universities, he gives a alternative example from state education. He says that if you actually learned from a practical education, you will become slow, mistrustful, resistant as a learner in general. In an attitude of hostile calm, one will allow the strange, the novel of every kind to approach one first. One will draw one's hand back from this education and stand with all doors open to prostrate oneself submissively before every pretty fact, to be ever itching to mingle with plunge into other people and other things. In short, our celebrated modern objectivity is bad taste, is ignoble par excellence. Okay, so there are more twists and turns and paradoxes in this quote, but I think what Nietzsche is saying is, is quite correct. A true education means that you wind up being capable of waiting, analyzing, making decisions based on a larger set of facts, not the latest and the prettiest and the most novel bit of news. But that's what a soldier is trained to do and is trained by the military school of life that Nietzsche would rather not see people around them do. They plunge themselves into others. They take action based on orders without thinking about the source of those orders. Okay, so what does all of this have to do with memory and memory science and so forth? Well, look at Nietzsche using the word novel here. We know from memory science that the brain craves novelty. Norepinephrine, for example, helps in memory formation. Norepinephrine is high, especially in new situations. And it's possible that one reason that we are on our computers constantly flipping between tabs and browsers and we're swiping endlessly on our screens over and over and over again, we're not just looking for more dopamine, but a cascade of many brain chemicals, including norepinephrine, which actually helps with memory formation. So if you hear a quote like, whatever doesn't kill me makes me stronger, and you're like, hell yeah, that's cool. It's novel to you and it can be much more memorable and you may not even think for a second, damn, I better look that up, you know, and maybe read it in the original language or see what is the text surrounding it, right? Because we are always on the hunt for the new and as hunter gatherers, we just grab it and we take it, it sticks in our memory and unthinkingly we start to become vectors that spread it around because we want the quick and the easy. The instantly memorable slogans that we can feel good about and feel good about spreading to others, even if upon any reflection, they're utterly meaningless. Another reason the first part of this quote may have been dropped away is that 
you know, Kriegsschule in German culture may sound a little bit like Krieg Schuld, which means war guilt. Now, I'm totally speculating here, but I lived in Germany for a long time, and there certainly is a war guilt in the culture that I observed. And even, you know, you start to feel it yourself if you live there long enough. So the German context following the first two world wars hadn't happened yet when Nietzsche was alive. But nonetheless, when we think of how his texts have circulated over time and how they've waxed and waned over time, there may be something to this. And people may have dropped that part of the quote because it has that similar sound between Kriegsschule and Kriegsschuld, uh, war school and war responsibility or war guilt. Now, I don't actually know how old the term Kriegsschule is, but you may want to go on a research project yourself. It's certainly in the original Nietzsche. Now, Elijah Milgram points out in his great book, Why Didn't Nietzsche Get His Act Together, that with Nietzsche, there's always more going on, always further surprises hidden inside one passage or another. In the vocabulary of video games, Nietzsche plants Easter eggs everywhere. And I think that this is a very apt observation from Milgram, that Nietzsche is filled with Easter eggs, and also he's changing his identity a lot. He's using different voices. He might be imitating the voice of a drunk in a knipe or a German pub. And this is really, really important to understand because it can throw you for a loop. Like, why is he saying this all of a sudden? This is a horrible idea. And he's not necessarily using his own voice, but rather imitating someone. And so we have to ask here, is he imitating someone? And that's part of critical thinking. It's part of how that he uses these Zen slaps to help wake you up to what meaning itself is, what it could mean in different contexts. And I think there's a clear and consistent way that Nietzsche does this, that invites repeat consideration without end. It practically requires an eternal return, which is one of his most famous ideas, that everything is repeating over and over and over again. And, you know, you want to return not merely to Nietzsche's texts, but to the many texts that precede him, to the texts that he himself quotes, often taking them out of context, but not ever dissuading you necessarily from reading them, but criticizing them in a way that should make them feel novel and hopefully make you want more. But we've seen that our hunter-gatherer ways often make us just go for the soundbite and leave the rest. And that's very, very problematic. Either way, it's not quite right to say, what doesn't kill me only makes me stronger. The Joker, I think, gets a little more closer to it, even if he cuts out the exact wording of the war school of life. It's the becoming stranger that matters when we mindlessly surrender ourselves to schools, when we mindlessly surrender ourselves to spreading little statements taken out of context and in an incomplete form. And you will be very strange indeed if you don't get your mind and memory sorted so you can slow down before letting that trained brain of yours yank you around. So if taking a pause to consider just how much your responses have been programmed isn't the love of wisdom and the wisdom of love that philosophy should be when it's at its best, I don't know what is. If you like videos like this, please be sure to hit that thumbs up, get subscribed, and I'm going to be starting another cohort of my live course, Beyond Sherlock, which is all about optimizing your memory for better critical thinking, stopping yourself from being a viral spreader of meaningless cliches without checking them out first, and you can get advanced notification by going to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash BY. You'll get a free lesson there called How to Think, gives you almost two dozen mental models that will help you interrogate even the most innocent sounding viral quotations and ultimately get more out of the life of your mind. One point that we need to cover before we go, if you're interested in memory, Nietzsche's human, all too human, talks about memory in so much depth. He talks about its role in truth and lying, and very interestingly, about how forgetfulness is perhaps a tool of evolution that helps us live with ourselves. And when it comes to forgetting, what do you think about this line from Human All Too Human? How slight the morality of the world would seem without forgetfulness. A poet could say that God had stationed forgetfulness as a guardian at the door of the temple of human dignity. In other words, we might just forget what certain quotes really mean because what they reveal about us 
as human, all too human, is too painful for the conscious mind to accept. So perhaps, looking forward at our new little series, What Makes It Memorable, we might need in the future to examine what makes Freud's quip that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar so memorable. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? If you want to watch more as I build up to other videos in the series, What Makes It Memorable, please check out my video on why critical thinking is so important for living a better life next. That way, you'll know more about how critical thinking ticks and how you can use it to make your life more memorable and how to know when a cigar is more than just a cigar because critical thinking is what's going to get you there.